Merry Christmas. Well, it's good to see you all here this morning. Take your Bibles and open them up to the most famous place to read about the Christmas story, Luke chapter 2. And uh, very traditional, you've probably heard this passage of scripture many times. And uh, I'm going to look at it from a little different perspective this morning. You know, people celebrate Christmas in different ways. Probably in your house you have certain traditions that you do. And, you know, different cultures celebrate Christmas in different ways. And uh, like if you were in France, in France, children put their shoes in front of the fireplace so that Father Christmas can build them. In Spain, people dance and sing in the streets after midnight mass on Christmas Eve. In Italy, the family prays while the mother places a figure of the Christ child in the manger. In Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, Christmas dinner includes rice pudding that has a single almond in it. Tradition says that whoever gets the almond will have good luck throughout. In Australia and New Zealand, New Zealand, December comes during the summer. So many people celebrate Christmas by going to the beach. I think we can do that here today. How do you celebrate Christmas? I want to look at Jesus' birth from the eyes this morning of the characters that were there on that first Christmas day. We're going to look at the shepherds, uh, the parents, the wise men, and some faithful believers. What did they see on that day? What did the birth of that child mean to them? I think they all had a little bit of a different perspective. And so if we look at what they would have been experiencing, on that day, it might help us to understand what Christmas is really all about. So if you go with me to Luke chapter 2, let's just read part of this chapter as we start out. Kind of set the stage for the Christmas story. Verse 1, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to the firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a <clears throat> Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom this day will rest. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Okay, we'll stop there for now. I want you to notice a couple things here. It says, in verse 4, it says, they went up to Bethlehem. Now, they lived in Nazareth, and when I was in Israel, Nazareth is north of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem, Nazareth is north. And I don't know about you, but when I say I'm going up somewhere, it means I'm going north. Is that, you guys agree with that? I'm going north. I, I can't stand it when somebody says, I'm going to go up to St. Louis. St. Louis is down. All right? <laughs> but if you go up somewhere, you go north. 
But here's the thing that I didn't realize until I got to Israel was that, that to go up to the area of, of Jerusalem and, that, and Bethlehem, you actually are going up because it's up to 2,500 feet above sea level. And so you actually do go, it's like going up a mountain to get up to Jerusalem and the Bethlehem area. So they were actually going up to Bethlehem. And uh, so we're going to first look at what the shepherds saw. What did the shepherds see? You know, the shepherds were heating their flocks, it says, around Jerusalem. And uh, there was a specific purpose for those flocks around Jerusalem. Those flocks that they had there, in fact, when we were in Israel, we saw a place where they call it the, the shepherd's field. So most of it is built up with city around there now, Bethlehem and, and uh, Jerusalem are kind of connected nowadays, but there's a field there that they say is the shepherd's field. And it's where they think the shepherds actually had the sheep out there, and the sheep had a specific purpose. The sheep were being raised there for the sacrifices at the temple. And so what the shepherds saw was a sacrificial lamb. Sacrificial lamb. You know, why did the angel come to them first? There were thousands of people around. Why did he choose the shepherds? I think it was because the angel was announcing a new lamb. A new lamb. It was not a coincidence that that announcement came to the shepherds. These were men that understood. They understood the purpose of that lamb. See, for a lamb to be qualified to be sacrificed, it had to be perfect. The shepherds understood that. It had to be without spot, without blemish. And so these shepherds took very good care of their sheep. They lived with their sheep. Okay? They were out there all the time with their sheep, living right with the sheep, taking very good care, making sure that their sheep were spotless so they'd be qualified for the sacrifice. Now, I did a little research and you know where lamb was first used the Bible. The first mention of a lamb in the Bible was in the account of Abraham and Isaac. Remember, God told Abraham, take your son Isaac and take him up to Mount Moriah, to a place I'm going to show you, and sacrifice your son. And we're like, that's crazy. Who would do that? Did you have to understand that question that day? It wasn't that uncommon. The pagan people all living all around Abraham, that's something they did. They sacrificed their children to their gods. So it was kind of an old thing. So Abraham was obedient. And he took off and he headed to Mount Moriah. And the interesting thing is, Mount Moriah is the exact, exact spot where the temple is, where the temple was. Where the temple was, where Solomon built his temple years and years later. But they get to the spot on Mount Moriah, and Isaac looks around and he says to his father Abraham, he says, Father, yes, my son Abraham, I am fighting wood over here, but where is the lamb for the bird off? That's the first mention of the lamb in the mark. Where's the lamb? And then Abraham answered, The Lord will provide. He'll provide one. And we know that God stopped him before he could sacrifice his son. And he supplied that sacrificial lamb. That was a picture of what Jesus came to do. That sacrificial lamb that Jesus came to give to us uh, many, many years later. Now, so here before the shepherd was a new lamb. One that would once and for all fulfill the need of the sacrificial lamb. Taking the sins of the whole world upon himself. See, we see throughout Scripture, Jesus referred to as a lamb. We see it in prophecy. If you look at these, note, these verses in your notes, we see it in prophecy. In Isaiah, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Talking about Jesus' crucifixion, like a lamb to the slaughter. We see it in uh, John the Baptist, what John the Baptist had to say. When Jesus came to get baptized, remember? Says John 1 29, the next day John sees Jesus coming into him and said, Behold, the lamp of God which takes away the sin of the world. And then we go all the way to the end of the book of, of the Bible, all the way to Revelation, 
And John saw it in a vision in the end times. He says, then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. The lamb, that sacrificial lamb. You know, the first death in the Bible was an Adam. Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? And everything was perfect. You can't imagine what that was like. They, they talked to God on just a personal level. Everything was perfect. The whole animal kingdom was perfect. There was no death. And then they sinned. They ate the fruit, right? What was the first thing God did? God had to kill some innocent animals to cover their sin. To get some skins to make clothes for them to cover their sin. That already right there was a picture of what Jesus came to do. It was a picture of that sacrificial lamb. That's why they had the sacrifices all through the Old Testament. Killing innocent, innocent animals to cover the sins of the guilty people. And that's what Jesus came to do. Shed his innocent blood to redeem the guilty people, to redeem us from the consequences of the sin. The shepherds understood it. I think they understood a little bit about that sacrificial life. Let's go to the next couple of characters. Mary and Joseph. Jesus earthly parents. What did they see? I think the first thing they saw was a child to be cared for. A child to be cared for. You know, she was a mother like any other mother. She did the best that she could for that child. She wrapped him in clothes and she laid him in the best place in that barn, a stable. Now, a barn in that day, and even today, you know, in Israel, they don't build anything with it's all stone and rock and, and or dug out of a cave or whatever. So this barn was probably like that. It was probably a, a cave or it was probably a stone building. Very cold, very, you know, not soft and warm. But the softest, the best place in that, in that stable was a manger. So she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger. She made him as comfortable as she could. She took care of him, you know. When the threat went out from Herod to kill the baby boy, they escaped to Egypt. They protected him. When they went back to Nazareth, Joseph taught him a trade. Taught him carpenter. I like the verse in verse 19. It says, but for Mary, treasured up all these things and kind of them. She didn't go around blabbing to everybody about how great my kid is. So she pondered him in her heart. She knew, she knew because the angel had come to her. And the angel had told her something. The other thing that I think that she knew was that he would be a future king. A future king. So the angel said to Mary, in back in Luke chapter 1, it says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, I imagine Mary thought, How could this be? Now, her family was poor. They lived the poor, in the poorest area of Israel. But I'll bet, I'll bet she knew her as history. The angel said, He's going to be like David. Remember the story of David? David was a shepherd boy and from a poor family. Nobody knew who David was until he killed that giant Goliath. And then everybody knew who David was. Just like that. I'll bet Mary was waiting for that moment. And she was thinking, someday everybody's going to know who this guy is. And she was like any other mother. She expected greatness from her child. She expected uh, a lot from her child, but in the meantime, she just did what any other mother would do. She watched him play, maybe taking some sticks and trying to fashion a chair like his, he had seen Joseph do so many times. She potty trained him, just like you ladies do. Uh, she probably taught him his colors and the alphabet just like you would any other child. Maybe she watched him 
play tag with the kids in the neighborhood. And all the while she's thinking, if you people only knew who this kid was, if you only knew. But she kept pondering it in her heart. She kept it in her, in her, to herself. Instead. As he was becoming a young man, what was going through Mary's mind? There was really nothing that unusual about him. Oh, well, there was that one time, that one time when they left him in the temple, remember? And, and they went back and found him three days later, and he's in there debating with the religious leaders, and everybody's marveling at how much this guy knows. There wasn't that guy, you know. Maybe he was a little bit different. But then he was in his 20s, and still helping his father and his partner to step shot. Mary was still pondering these things in her heart. She was probably thinking, I know the angel told me he's going to be a king, but do kings spend their life just making things out of wood? What was going through her mind? But she knew there was something special. She knew there was something special about it. Oh, and then there was, then there was the wedding of Cana. Remember? Remember the wedding of Cana? They're all celebrating, and all of a sudden they run out of wine. What would this Mary do? She says, hey, Jesus, they ran out of wine. She said, Mary, shh, don't tell them. Shh. Mary, one of the people says, hey, take Go to Jesus. He can fix this problem. It's almost like she's pushing him out there saying, Jesus, you can do it. So Jesus turned the water into wine. His first miracle. He was kind of pushed out there by the boat. You ever do that with your kids? I remember when Jesse was about oh, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, we needed somebody to sing a solo in church one time, so I volunteered her. She chewed me out. She was mad at me for a long time. <laughs> but look where she's at today, right? Parents see things in their kids. Mary saw some things in Jesus. I think Mary knew that he was destined for greatness. But yet she pondered things in her heart. She kept it to herself until the time came. And the time was right. <laughs> time for Jesus to run his ministry. And she kind of helped him along. So they saw a child to be taken care of and they also saw a future king. There's a couple other characters in this story that we don't often hear about. Two people by the name of Simeon and Anna. Let's read the rest of the story in Luke uh, chapter 2 starting in verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, they're going by the law of Moses. By the law of Moses, a boy child is supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day, and then um, 33 days after circumcision, a woman is, is declared unclean and she's going to be supposed to go to the temple to be declared clean. And uh, she was supposed to go to the temple and offer a lamb and a pigeon or a dove. Now if the family was poor, if they couldn't afford a lamb, they could take two doves or two pigeons. And we find that uh, in Leviticus chapter 12. There. So, let's see what they did. Um... Verse 23, as it is written with the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Notice, they were poor. They took a pair of doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do.
do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised you now, dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for this in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken again, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce, pierce your own soul too. <coughs> There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Okay. Two saints. What were they doing? They were waiting. Waiting. They had a dream. I think they had their dream realized. The two saints in uh, at the temple. What did they see? They saw their dream realized. When Simeon had been waiting for the Messiah, somehow he knew the time was close. God told him he would see the Messiah before he died. Every day he got up and he asked himself, is this the day? Is this the day? Is this the day it's going to be? You know, we're kind of like that. We're thinking, you know, Jesus is coming back anytime, you know? Sometimes he's going to come back. He's going to come back soon. So I get up every morning, I think, is this the day? Is this the day? So I thought it was going to be last Friday, right? We kind of missed out. In case you haven't noticed. <laughs> is this the day? But he is coming back sometimes. Maybe will be old like Simeon was when he finally comes. And maybe he won't come in our life, but he is coming. He is coming. Their dream was realized. He saw a baby that would become a man. He didn't just see a baby. He saw a man. And he saw that because of his teachings, hearts would be exposed for what they really are. Look at what he wrote in verse 35. He says, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul to you. Don't the teaching is Jesus really revealed the heart? Isn't that what he really came for? You know, the Old Testament, all the Old Testament could do was to judge the outside actions of a person. But what Jesus came to do was to look at the heart. He came to work on our hearts. And, uh, you know, many times in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus went through some of the old Ten Commandments. And he talked about, you know, the Old Testament, you know, you've heard it says you shall not kill. But I tell you, if you hate your brother, you're guilty. Hate is in the heart. And killing is an outward action. And he turned it all into a, a heart issue. And then there was Anna, 84 years old. Waiting for the inside. Waiting for the inside. In our small group last week, we studied about waiting. About how important it is to wait on God. And what, what blessings God gives us when we wait on Him. And look, look at this verse in Isaiah. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for these people were waiting. They were waiting with expectation. That's the difference between just sitting around and waiting and doing nothing. These people were waiting with expectation. They were going to the temple every day to be there when the Lord came. They were prepared. Most of the people of that generation missed it. Jesus came and they're like, Who? who's Jesus? What, what's he here for? And they wound up killing him eventually. These people didn't miss it because they were waiting expectantly. That's a lesson for us today, to wait expectantly. expectantly. Then there's some other characters in the story. What the wise men saw. Turn, turn with your Bibles to Matthew. 
He has that account in Matthew chapter 2. And uh, we think of, we call them the wise men. Um, the Bible doesn't really call them that. Um, they were um, magi, it calls them. And uh, we think there's three, there were three of them. The Bible doesn't say that. The only reason we think that is because of the three gifts of the hand. It could have been more. There could have been ten. There could have been fifty. We don't know. But uh, we know that there were some wise men in the hand. Let's read the first twelve verses of Matthew chapter 2. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was king, who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly found out from them. The exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too can go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped and they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and of incense and myrrh. And having been warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by the route. <coughs> Where were they from? Well, we don't know exactly, it just says from the east. Somewhere from the east. Somewhere east of Jerusalem, east of Israel. <laughs> and they were probably Gentiles. And, uh, but apparently, they had been influenced by some Jewish traditions. The Jewish teaching. Probably, most likely, they were from Babylon. Remember, Daniel was in Babylon. The three Hebrew boys was in Babylon. A lot of Jews stayed in Babylon after the after the captivity, and so there was a lot of Jewish influence in Babylon. And so these guys apparently knew some scripture because they asked, "Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews?" But they went to Jerusalem. If they had known the scripture really good, they would have gone to Bethlehem. Because that verse in Micah 5 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. If they'd have known that verse, they'd have gone to Bethlehem. But instead, they went to Jerusalem and they asked around, Where is it? Then they brought some gifts. Is there anything significant in those gifts? Let's look at the gifts a little bit. First thing they brought was gold. Now we know gold is a precious metal. In that era, gold was for kings. Kings had gold. Uh, objects of worship were made of gold. Remember the golden calf in the wilderness? Remember the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with gold? Important things had gold. Gold signifies Christ's deity. And then there was frankincense. Incense and that not being all. Now it's a it's a white resin of gum. You get it by the certain trees where you peel back the bark of the tree and there's frankincense inside that tree under the bark. Frankincense is a symbol of holiness and righteousness. Exodus 30, God gives a recipe for making some incense that they were supposed to burn at the tabernacle, at the door of the tabernacle. It's got a really sweet smell to it. And they were supposed to burn this incense, or this uh, incense at the door of the tabernacle. And the main ingredient was frankincense. So it, it's, frankincense is a symbol of holiness and righteousness. So that gift to the Christ child was symbolic of his willingness to become sacrifice, giving himself up like a And then there was burn. Myrrh. Myrrh is a product of the living. It, it too came from a tree. 
myrrh was bitter. In fact, remember on the cross when they gave him uh, myrrh, which was gall, they said it was or vinegar mixed with gall, that was myrrh that they that they gave. They, they would mix that with drinks as a, a potion that would kind of dumb, numb your senses. And uh, it was very bitter. It symbolizes bitterness, suffering, and affliction. How the baby Jesus grew to suffer greatly. You know that. So in all these different things, we see the symbols. We see symbolic things about Jesus' life. And all this. But I want you to ask yourself a question this morning. What do I see in Christmas? What does it mean to me? Is it the fun stuff that we do, giving gifts to each other, and and uh, eating lots of food and, and all these things. You know, the separate shepherds, they saw a sacrificial lamb. Mary and Joseph saw a child who cared for in the future king. The saints in the, in the temple saw their dream come true. The wise men saw prophecies fulfilled. What do you see? What do you see? When you think about Christmas, it's about anticipation of why am I going to get to Christmas? <coughs> it's about traveling and being with family. Or maybe it's remembering family friend members that aren't here anymore. Or is it the joy of giving gifts? See the light of the child's eyes, they did a new joy. It was fun, we kind of had our Christmas little early the other night. Giving gifts in his new tricycle to his class. Seeing him try to master that thing and write. Or maybe it's decorating a beautiful Christmas tree and putting lights up all over your house. What is it? Well, my mind went crazy yesterday and I wrote another poem to encapsulate this, so you're going to have to put up with another one of my sheets. Keeping Christ in Christmas. It's Christmas time once again, I see. Are they coming faster, or is it just me? There are pageants, recitals, and plays galore. Some are fun, but others are such a bore. But Christmas, what does it really mean? Is it really about Santa driving his team? Prancer, Blitzman, Blitzman, and Rudolph with nose of red, traveling through the night, pulling Santa's sled. Or is Christmas about presents under a festive tree? Oh my, what is it? The curiosity is killing me. Or is Christmas about turkey and dressing and endless desserts? I'll die up next year so I can fit in my shirts. <laughs> Some say that Christmas is all about giving. I really think that is a good way of living. Some people seem to have forgotten their schooling. They write to marry Xmas. No, I'm not fooling. The X replaces a very important part of the word. It's Christ Jesus, you see, and he is our Lord. That name is the most important name on earth. And Christmas is all about his birth. So this year, with all the fun and festivities, don't leave Christ out of your activities. So that's my point this morning. What does Christmas mean to you? Don't forget why that baby was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. For a purpose. He split our calendar in the <coughs> BC and AD. And he did much more than that. Much more than that. He came for a purpose. In our it's about a lamb, a sacrifice. God give visiting us the greatest gift ever. Father, we just come to you this morning. Thank you, Father, for um, that lamb. Not just any lamb, but a perfect lamb. A lamb that was sent into our world for a reason. Help us not to forget that reason and see. Father, as we, as we celebrate uh, that birth once again, I pray that you would help us.